Good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Chaz. Um, I am, uh, uh, I've been here once before, about this time last year, and uh, so I'm back again. I'm glad to be here. My first three career moves after college were completely different moves, and I had no idea what I was doing in any of the roles. So I, I just did, what I, what I did is I decided, you know, I'm just going to study. I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm going to follow my training, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God for the rest. And this particular fundraising position, um, it was kind of high stress. There was a you know, high volume of, of, of dollars that needed to be raised, and we had a ton of fundraising events. So before each fundraising event, I would pray. And our team really started to, to do well after a while, and we started to set records for some of the fundraising events. We were the, the top one to two offices in the state and the top 25 to 50 in the country. And it got so that, that people in other offices were asking, what are they doing? And I just said, I'm praying. So people from other offices would call me up and say, I have a fundraising event tomorrow. Can you pray for my event? So I did. Um, and what was interesting is I was not the most talented person in that group, and not by far. But what I did is I followed my training, and I, and I trusted God and, and sought Him for the rest. So every first-time event, really God led me through and showed me what was next. And today we're going to look at a first-time event in the Bible, and we're going to see how God orchestrates how Abram is to respond to it. But before we jump right in, if you would join me in prayer, that would be awesome. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day that we can come and, and just be a family together, Lord, and, and just uh, worship you, Lord, through song, through, through the word, Lord. And uh, we just pray that uh, as I'm your vessel today, Lord, as I'm sharing your word, Lord, I just pray that it impacts my life and it impacts everyone's life here in a way that we can, when we leave here, we'll be will be called to do something, Lord. And I just, uh, I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, if you have a Bible with you, um, if you want to turn to Genesis 14, that's where we're going to spend most of our, our time this morning. And just to give you a little bit of a summary, of kind of saying the context for what we're going to go through in Genesis 13, Abram um, and his nephew Lot separated. They were traveling together for, for quite some time. But they separated because of the, the great wealth that they accumulated while they were in Egypt. And they had so much wealth that the land in which that they were living could not support them. And some of this wealth included, uh, included livestock, people, and other things that made it difficult for them to, to live in the area where they were. So Abram, he, he took the first step and he said, Lot, you can choose wherever you'd like to go. If you want to go to the right, then I'll go to the left. If you want to go to the left... I'll go to the right. And Lot chose to, to live in the Jordan Valley, which was a great worldly choice to live by the Jordan Valley. It was, it was beautiful terrain, good agriculture, but Lot didn't do a whole lot of investigating as to what the, the culture was like in terms of the people. So he got caught up in a, a, a not so good environment. And Genesis 13, 12a says that Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. So that's where Lot was. He was involved, he was in a, in a community that was, that was not positive, wicked, and constantly sinning, not an ideal location for anyone to move. There, I don't know if there were stats back then where there were, you know, a crime stats or something like that. There probably wasn't a, uh, an opportunity for that, but that's essentially kind of what he walked into was a very, you know, unstable area. So in chapter 14 now, we, we see some of the consequences of Lot's decision as he gets caught up, uh, kind of a casualty of a, of a nasty war. And the first 10 verses of, of chapter 14 talks about, uh, uh, talks about war, and it's the first time that war is mentioned in the Bible. Not the first time violence is mentioned in the Bible, but the first time where war is. And it mentions the, kind of the key players. And rather than reading the entire first 10 verses, which is somewhat redundant and, and confusing, I just have a chart here I'd like to show you with the, with the, play, with the, with the players of, of, of this war. So there are two sides. You had an alliance on uh, the, 
On the left here, the Mesopotamia Valley. And these are some fun names. Um, it's Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arya, king of Elisar, Shadalo Omar, king of Alam, and uh, Tadal, king of Goyim. So that's, that's the first side. On the other side are the five kings from the Jordan Valley. And this is where uh, Lot is living, and it's, uh, specifically in Sodom. We have uh, Bira, king uh, of... Uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> let me try this again. Bira, king of Saddam, of Sodom, I mean. Birsha, king of Gomorrah. Shekinab, king of Adma. Shemeber, king of Zebuim. And Zoar, king of Bala. I am so glad the Bible has an audio translation. So, <laughs> so these are the alliances, and, and we have a map here that kind of shows a little, it's a little blurry, but over here on, on the right-hand side, we've got the, the Mesopotamia Valley, and over here on the left-hand side, we have the Jordan Valley. So you can see it's really the first international conflict ever mentioned in human history. And the battle that occurs... Um, near the valley of uh, Sad uh, Sadim, which is where the Salt Sea now is. And it seems like the battle was initiated because the kings of the Jordan Valley wanted their independence from King Shadalo Omar, king of Alam. Verse 4 uh, talks about this and says, Twelve years they had served Shadalo Omar, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. Well, their battle for independence didn't really go all that well. As we can see in verses 8 through 10, it says, Then the king of so uh, Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zebuim, and the king of Bala, that is Zoar, went out and they joined battle in the valley of Sadim with Shadalo Omar, king of Alam, Tadal, king of Goyim, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arya, king of Elisar, four kings against five. I can just kind of, okay, that went, over, went better in my head than, than out there. Okay. Now the valley of Sadim was full of butamen pits. These are like icky kind of tar pits, like not real pleasant. Um, and as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into these butamen tar pits, ick, and the rest fled into the hill country. So this was a really nasty battle. And to this day, there, are, there is still some remnants of the battle taking place if you go visit this area. There was intense destruction and loss. And the, the victors of the battle were absolutely ruthless. As we can see in verses 11 and 12, it says, so the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions and went their way. So here we see Lot's choice in Genesis 13, 13, really coming back to bite him. He went with what was uh, uh, pleasing to the eye, a beautiful area which, from, from the worldly standpoint, but he ended up in the Jordan Valley amongst those who were wicked people who continually sinned against God. And Lot, his desires for success and for wealth cost him his freedom. And now he's a captor of Shadal Omar. And this is not a, a good thing at all. And there were one of three fates, if you're the, you are a captor of Shadal Omar, it was slavery, torture, or death. So Lot is in a heap of a mess here, and his future is bleak. But one of, his, one of Lot's men escapes and tells Abram what's going on. So Abram gets the news and now he has to decide, what is he going to do? I mean, it's kind of Lot's fault that he's in this predicament. I mean, he chose, he made his choice. He chose to go to this area, and he seems to make a lot of bad choices. So what is Abram to do? Well, here we see how God helped Abram respond in three ways to Lot's crisis. And the first way that God helps Abram respond to Lot's crisis is with preparation. In verses 14 to 16, it says, When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them 
and pursued them to Hobad, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. So when, Lot, when Abram got the news about Lot, he didn't say, you know, serves Lot right. He didn't say, that's what he gets for choosing Sodom. Abram did not give up on Lot. And Abram calls Lot his kinsman. And that's a significant name to call Lot. And kinsman in Hebrew is uh, translated as brother. So even though Abram and Lot are uncle and nephew, Abram had such a fondness for Lot that he saw him as his brother. And Lot was family, and he was hurting. And Abram, once he got word of what was going on, he was in pursuit of Lot, and he was in pursuit of Lot immediately. And how was he able to do that? How was he able to be in pursuit of Lot immediately. Well, he was able to do that because he was prepared. It says that he led 318 trained men from his household. And the word trained seems to indicate that Abram was preparing for something. He may not have known what that something was, but he knew that he needed to train these men. And because he trained these men, he was able to respond to Lot's crisis at a moment's notice. And then the 318 men defeated the alliance of four kings that just defeated five kings. And if these men, if they hadn't been trained, they would not have been able to respond to Lot's crisis. And Lot would have most likely lost his life. But Abram, he was prepared and willing to act. And he used his resources to help. He was prepared and willing to act and use his resources to help. We never know when we'll be called to serve God at a moment's notice. And the question is, are we trained and prepared to act? Scripture says that we should be trained in 1 Timothy 4.8. It says physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and the life to come. So we're to train for godliness, which produces benefits in this life and the life to come as we're leading people to Jesus. So are we engaged in this type of training so that we're prepared to act? And is there something right now that God has called us to do for a brother or sister who might be in trouble or is hurting? And maybe we need to join a brother and sister in battle. And maybe this battle is addiction, loss, or sickness. And is there someone that maybe is walking through something right now that we need to join them in battle because they can't fight? for this battle themselves, much like Lot was kind of at the mercy of his captor. And maybe we need to start, we need to in, engage in battle and help the person who can't fight. And maybe that part, that fighting that we do is on our knees and praying to God. Friends, we can't all do everything, but we can all do something. At times through my life and, and during this last year, I've had a battle, and that battle has been anxiety and depression. And it's kind of embarrassing for a pastor to admit that he's battled with anxiety and depression. And normally it's, it's viewed in different ways. Um, and it can, like I said, it can be embarrassing. Um, you can kind of go down the, uh, the shame game. Um, but as, I was, as I've walked out this battle, there have been people who've walked out the battle with me. There have been people that I've been able to, that have called me and that have texted me and emailed me and checked in with me to see how I'm doing. And there have been people that I've been able to call, text, or email that have been there for me 
during this battle. And we don't need 318 trained men to respond to something. All we need to do is be like Abram, be prepared and willing to act. And our preparedness, it could be life experiences that we've gone through that that maybe someone else is, is now going through, and we can walk alongside and join them in battle. It could be some resources that we have in the community, maybe material things, or it could be that we are being trained up in the Word so that when a crisis hits, that we're able to respond with encouragement from the Lord. And the question is, are we willing to use whatever or however God has prepared us at a moment's notice? Again, we can't do everything, but we can all do something. So Abram and his men defeated the enemy. They rescued, he rescued Lot and brought back all the, possession, uh, all, all the possessions and, and the prisoners from the battle. And when we use what God is, is, is uh, preparing for us to use or do what God is preparing us to do, it could have ripple effects on others. And Abram, when he stepped out and he, and he uh, used what God was, was calling him to use, it had a ripple effect of the, from the, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem, both of whom wanted to show appreciation to Abram for what he did, and both of whom showed appreciation in different ways. So let's look at how each of them showed their appreciation. First, Abram meets Melchizedek. He's the king of Salem. And let's see what happens in verses 17 to 20. It says, After his return from the defeat of Shedal Omar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheev, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. Okay, let's dissect this a little bit. Um, first of all, who is Melchizedek? Well, he is, he is uh, described as two things in that text. He's described, one, as a king. So he's described as a king of Salem. And Salem is Hebrew um, and it's short for Jerusalem, which means peace. He's also uh, described as Mel- uh, Melchizedek as being a, uh, as his name being uh, my na- uh, as his name meaning my king is righteous or king of righteousness. And the book of Romans, we know that we are righteous through our faith in Christ. So we know that Melchizedek is a believer and he's not a pagan king. Also, Melchizedek is viewed as a priest. And he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek and priest of the God Most High. (laughs) Melchizedek was both a king and a priest. And in the same way, our Lord Jesus is both our king and our high priest. And in reference to Jesus' priesthood, we read in uh, in Hebrews 6.20, and where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, excuse me, uh, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what does it mean that Jesus is our high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek? Well, it means that Jesus, our Lord's priesthood, is eternal and it lasts forever. And later in the Old Testament, after Moses, there were priests that came after Melchizedek in the line of Aaron under the Mosaic law. And that law ended with Jesus as the fulfillment of the Mosaic law. But Jesus was not in the line or the order of, of, of Aaron. He was from the tribe of Judah. So the comparison to Melchizedek is that neither Jesus nor he had a priestly lineage like an end, uh, with an end like Aaron's. And because of that similarity, scholars point out that Melchizedek is likely an Old Testament picture for Christ. A picture of someone who that encourages the believer like Jesus did or does. So what did Melchizedek do? Well, what he did was the second way that God helps Abram respond to Lot's crisis, and that's with praise. 
So Melchizedek, he spent some time with Abram. He gave him some bread and wine. So he had some fellowship. And he gave Abram a blessing that gave praise to God. And here's the blessing. <clears throat> it said that... Uh, uh, it said that he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So here Melchizedek is giving praise to God Most High for the victory. He's not giving praise to Abram, um, and he's not giving praise to uh, the enemies and, and some of their uh, mistakes along the way. He's saying that he is giving credit to God Most High. And when you think about it, the miraculous victory that occurred could not have, could not have happened without God. And Abram, yes, Abram had to obey, had to be willing to act. But this fighting force that Abram defeated all but destroyed five kingdoms. And then 318 men destroyed that fighting force. So Melchizedek reminds Abram that God delivered the victory to him, and it would not have been possible without God. And sometimes we can get caught up. We can get caught up in our own successes and forget that God is actually the one giving us the ability to have that success. And God, he desires the praise for our successes, and it's really to our own benefit to help keep us grounded. Just recently, Derek Carr, quarterback for the Oakland Raiders, signed, which was at the time, the most lucrative contract in NFL history. And I want to show you a short clip that shows, that shows you what he plans to do with the money. Your priorities are in life and everything are well known, huh. but it is a huge contract. Um, just, and you're not really an extravagant guy, but is there one thing that you that you're going to sort of splurge on that you can let Chick, us? Have? Chick Fil A, probably Chick Fil A. Uh, I've been eating clean, lad. We got lad here. He's been having me eat clean. I'll probably get some Chick Fil A, but uh, no. Uh, first thing I'll do is I'll pay my tithe, like I have since I was in college, getting seven hundred dollars on a scholarship check. Um, you know that that won't change. I'll do that. Uh, I'll probably give my wife something nice. Um, you know, even though she begs me not to, she she still gets coupons. Ever since we, ever since I've known her, she finds coupons. She gets online trying to find discounts and all those things, and uh, none none of that's going to change. The, the exciting thing for me, money wise, honestly, is that this money is going to help a lot of people. Um, uh, you know, I'm very thankful to have it that it's in our hands because it's going to help people not only in this country but in a lot of countries around the world, um, and that's what that's what's exciting to me. It was very. It was like surreal at first. I was like, all right, man, that's like Monopoly, man. That's, that's weird, you know. Um, but then, like, as I began to see it and how we could place it in certain areas and began to see what kind of impact that could really make, uh, that's when it hit me. Like, that, you, know, I, you know, I didn't want to talk about that, but I've been down to Haiti. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, some of those struggles that they have and the kids there, and my heart just, I, I cry sometimes thinking about it. And so... Just knowing that we can go down there and just make a difference and help, uh, that's, those are the kind of things uh, that the money makes me kind of like, oh my gosh, you know, because now we can really do some things to help a lot of people. All right. So if you not, haven't rooted for Derek Carr, maybe now is the time to start. <laughs> so obviously Derek Carr, he's a follower of Christ, and uh, when they asked him what he you know, plans to do with the money. He, you know, he talked about uh, Chick Fil A, which is never a bad choice, and uh, he talked about you know in there about uh, giving something for his for his wife. But what he said, kind of out of the gate, was just very subtly how he's going to honor and praise God. He said he's going to give us give the first thing he's going to do is he's going to give a tithe, and which which he's going to give a, a you know ten percent of his money to his local church. And Derek Carr, he sees the opportunity that he has to make an impact. And he sees that that opportunity actually has come from God. So he's giving God the honor and the praise, and he is excited that he's able to, to use those funds uh, also to help people in Haiti and, and other places. So he 
wants to use this opportunity and his platform to, to be a blessing, uh, to be a blessing uh, from God. And Melchizedek, his blessing reminds Abram where his victory came from. And as a result, in uh, Genesis 14, 20b, Abram gives him a tenth of everything. So recognizing God's role in his victory, Abram provides a tithe, 10%, to symbolize what we are to praise and worship God with, with percentage of the wealth that, that he gives us, no matter what that amount is. And after Abram's encounter with Melchizedek, any prideful feelings that he had about being the one that should take credit for, for Lot's rescue was replaced with giving the one true God honor and praise. So he left that meeting with Melchizedek in strong fellowship, which is really going to help him in his encounter with the king of Sodom. And if the king of Salem was most likely an Old Testament picture for Christ, the thing of the king of Sodom is most likely an Old Testament picture of Satan. You can see what happens here in verse uh, 21. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. So in plain speak, he's basically saying, You know, bring my people back, but keep all this money here and all this wealth kind of as a payment for your services. And Abram's answer to the king of Sodom is a third way that God helps him respond to Lot's crisis, and that's with principle. But Abram, he responded to the king of Sodom and said, I have lifted my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap of anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich. So as a result of his meeting with Melchizedek, Abram resisted the offer from the king of Sodom, and he was able to give a great testimony to the Lord. And Abram, he did what he did as a response for his love for his brother Lot. And he didn't want to be viewed as a mercenary. So he said emphatically, I've lifted my hands to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say, I have made Abram rich. I wonder what we would have said if we would have been tempted with that money. Could we have justified it in our minds and said, you know, I'll, I'll take, this, take this money, and I'm sure I can use some of it for good. But Abram, he saw the subtle attempts of the enemy and, he, and the possibility of being indebted to a wicked king, and he wanted nothing of that. Satan, one of his crafty attributes is he attacks us right after victories. It happened here with Abram, happened with Gideon and countless others in Scripture. And we're often vulnerable to Satan's temptation after victories in life. And oftentimes, we think that we are the reason for the victory. And when we take the credit, Satan can kind of wedge in with that pride and he can, he can kind of get us to start really questioning really who is responsible for that victory. So we need to be in prayer for, for someone like a Derek Carr who is, uh, now has this great opportunity to impact, you know, impact the community, but Satan would love nothing more for him to get caught up and to be, uh, get caught up in the money and the fame that he's going through. That's why I just love this chapter, and I love, again, as I said earlier, how God is like the best director ever of our life and how he orchestrates our life. And this chapter really is, is just an example of that, where you know, God gives us the ability to respond to situations like the 318 trained men. And then he reminds us through fellowship with him and, and also fellowship with others where the victory comes from. And then, and he does this so that when we are tempted by the evil one, we can have battle armor to reject those temptations. So God helps Abram respond to Lot's crisis 
with preparation, praise, and principle. So how is God orchestrating our next step? And how is he preparing us to respond at a moment's notice to someone in need? And how do we need to join him in this preparation? And when God takes us on this next step, and when success comes, how will we respond? Will we respond with praise and principle? Or will we take the credit, making us vulnerable to temptation? Now, now I'm not saying that we shouldn't be happy or proud of a job well done and the hard work that we put into things. We should. We should celebrate that. But the question is, are we inviting God into the celebration? And are we giving Him the glory and credit where credit is due? So God, right now, He's orchestrating our next step. Only He knows what that is, and and in time, we're going to know that too. And the question is, how prepared are we and how willing are we to be used for the battle? Because we can't do everything, but we can all do something. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we we just thank You for this example Lord of Abram, Lord, and we just, uh, Lord, we uh, we just ask you to uh, help us prepare for uh, that next thing, whether it's uh, whether it's joining someone individually in battle, whether it's uh, having joint, just being ready to fight a personal battle for you know ourselves, Lord, and I just ask that you uh, just. Encourage and train us, Lord, and just uh, uh, meet with meet with us as we're going through this, Lord, and that that uh, uh, Lord that you can just provide the encouragement along the way, Lord. Help us to see uh, those next steps, Lord, and help us to look for those, Lord, and help us to give you all the credit and all the glory. Uh, in Jesus' name, Amen.